Thanks everyone for joining in. Uh, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Dr. Dennis to all of you. Uh, Dr. Dennis is not a stranger to most of you at Agile India. She's She's been a keynote speaker before at Agile India and also at uh, the Open Data Science, the ODAC conference. Uh, you know, so we've been fortunate to have her. Uh, I remember traveling to Sydney, meeting her uh, in the lobby and trying to convince her to come to India. And she was <laughs> she gracefully accepted the invite. Uh, and uh, you know we've we've now known each other for a while. Uh, she's been doing some amazing uh, research work and uh, open source work. Uh, the way I, I generally like to introduce Dr. Dennis is, you know, in the data science field. Uh, generally, they call data scientists as, uh, you know, there's a term that some, some data scientists uh, get the privilege of, and they're called as unicorn data scientists. Uh, and, and a unicorn data scientist is someone who has deep subject matter expertise, uh, who understands computer science and, and really knows, uh, you know, a lot about programming and other parts of computer science. And also the third aspect is the math and the stat side of things. And uh, in my experience, I think, uh, you know, she, she scores 10 on 10 on every <laughs> of these areas. So uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, listen to Dr. Dennis, uh, the, the real work she's doing to actually impact uh, millions of lives. So it's, it's a, such an honor to kickstart this conference with uh, Dr. Dennis. So Without much delay, I want to hand it over to Dr. Dennis. Uh, over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much for the very generous introduction. And as always, I say I am not a unicorn because the skill sets that I have, probably a majority of people in the audience have as well. And if not, this is something that is worthwhile to learn along the way. And hopefully, this talk inspires you to pick up the skill sets that you might be missing. So, on that, Let's jump straight in and let me share my screen. So let's get started with how digital disruption in the healthcare system really streamline, uh, streamlines medical research. So I'd like to start with a, um, with a statement that is potentially divisive in saying that technology has become as important or almost as important as clinicians themselves. And by that, I mean that it sort of has seeped into every element of healthcare um, technology or, or the healthcare system. And therefore, a clinician that is underpinned or supported by technology is performing way better than a clinician who is not. But in order to enable clinicians to really perform at that high level, we do need to build those technologies. And I think everyone here in the audience probably is capable, interested, um, and certainly needed in order to help build these technologies. So with that, allow me to introduce the research organization that I work for, which is Australia's government research agency, CSIRO. At CSIRO, we're really passionate about translating research into products that people can use in their everyday lives. The most famous product is, of course, Wi-Fi, which we co-invented together with Macquarie University and is now used in more than 5 billion devices worldwide. On a more clinical side or health side, um, the product that I'd like to highlight here is CardiHub which was the first clinically validated mobile app for heart rehabilitation, where a mobile technology was included in the clinical practice in order to streamline and improve the clinical care. And then, of course, on a lighter note, together with Samri, we developed the Total Wellbeing Diet, where the recipe book is now on the book bestseller list alongside Harry Potter and the Da Vinci Code, from my perspective, we do have this nice balance between products that people enjoy and products that people need. So I am clearly a bit more on the need side with working in the um, genome analysis with the um, medical science there. And therefore, the stories that I want to tell you today are threefold. So the first one is around how can we create digital technologies that can scale to populations, so can handle the volumes of data that is needed in order to look after a whole population in a country. The second one is then the progression of that, of saying, well, if you have this volume of data, you do need to interact with that data. And this is where the interoperability and the data exchange story comes in and how we can bring this really into the clinical practice. 
And the last one is around science accessibility and how the technology that we invent can empower innovation and really you know, create something that is larger than the sum of their parts. So with that, everyone has mutations that should inform their clinical practice. So remember the genome, which is basically the blueprint that uh, defines how every cell in our body, how our organs interact with each other and how our whole system functions, um, holding information about what kind of treatments, um, what kind of drugs we respond to and what kind of future disease risks we have. So of course, with all that information encoded into that genome into the 3 billion letters of our genome, we should be using it more and more in the clinical practice to find the treatments that work rather than having to go on a diagnostic odyssey and to do better prevent prevention that if we have a disease risk that we might you know, have symptoms in 10 to 20 years, we might want to do something today, lifestyle choices today um, in order to prevent those symptoms from potentially even happening. So, but identifying or unlocking this, this information that is in the genome is difficult. I was saying there are 3 billion letters in the genome and it's like finding the needle in the haystack. And typically the way that it's done is that when you want to find disease genes, so genes that influence a future disease risk, for example, you typically go and collect individuals um, you look at their genome and you identify the differences between one person and the next. And typically there are on average 2 million differences between each, between each individual. So you identify those differences, you collect people that have a disease and a healthy control cohort, and then you identify what in the genome actually makes the cases, like the people that have the disease, different from the ones that um, are the control. And again, coming back to the 3 billion letters and not each one of those um, positions contributing equally, it is a really complex task. And we're using machine learning in order to identify these complex interactions in the genome that inform disease. Now, in order to do that, in order to do machine learning on a 3 billion data set times 10,000 um, individuals, so a trillion data point data set. Um, typically, machine learning is very difficult to run on that because all that information needs to be kept in memory in order to reiterate over that. And we're probably all familiar with the traditional high performance compute, compute cluster, HPC clusters, and they are designed for compute intensive tasks. But what we're dealing with here is data intensive tasks. So all that information in a high performance compute setting cannot be kept on one node. And this is basically what I'm showing here with a um, little black outline around the orange CPUs in there. The data that has to go from one node to the next node, it has to be programmed specifically, this transaction to be handled properly. Whereas in the data intensive world, that is happening all the time. Therefore, this exchange um, is really cumbersome to implement. But luckily, Apache Spark has come along, uh, which basically dissolves the boundary between the nodes. So each CPU in the cluster can be accessed and it's sort of a standardized way of doing this. So built on Spark, we developed Variant Spark, which is the machine learning method for genomic analysis. And we've shown that on today's data, it's 3.6 times faster than the technologies that are available from Google and from other organizations around the world. But the key is that it's only increasing linearly, which means that on tomorrow's data sets, which is more than a trillion data points, it can handle that kind of data in 15 hours rather than 100,000 years, which other technologies will take. So obviously with this enormous compute power, what we're doing is we're going to the cloud because the commodity hardware in the cloud is basically virtually unlimited and therefore our Spark clusters can become really large. And this is basically what I'm showing here with the architecture diagram of an AWS um, web service where we have the Elastic Map Produce, the Spark cluster here in the middle. Um, it's interacting with the actual data on an S3 bucket. It has security groups, VPN security around it, and we access that with a Jupyter Notebook. 
And the key with this setup is that we can just change the data that is fed into the actual framework, which means that we can apply it to, for example, motor neuron disease. Well, uh, motor neuron disease is a disease that you might be familiar with from um, Stephen Hawking, who suffered from that. And the, um, the key of that consortium was to identify the underlying molecular mechanisms or the disease genes that drive the disease. And here we looked at 15,000 case controls. But what I was saying is that the data is basically independent from the rest of the year. Um, of the framework. Therefore, we can also apply it to heart disease. And here, we're currently working with the largest genomic data set that is available around the world, which in this case is 50,000 case controls. So 50,000 people with the disease, without the disease. And again, the idea is, can we find the drivers that, um, that, that are causing specific heart disease? And here, the, the key finding was, that we all know that um, when you have certain um, protein markers in your blood, then you have a certain an elevated risk. But the thing with this is that it found that you can have this normal protein marker that would classify you as healthy. But if you have a genomic marker that puts you at higher risk, even that normal level means that you are at increased risk of suffering from a heart attack. So this is vital information in order to reclassify who is actually at risk of developing heart disease. And then we went one step further and applied it to COVID genomes. So COVID, um, the virus that is causing COVID-19, it was um, sampled and sequenced from around the world. And we now have over or almost 5 million samples available from that. And here the question was, can we identify the ones that are causing more severe disease? And the reason for that is that we know that the virus is mutating. So when it first uh, transferred from or crossed from bat, probably through an intermediate um, host to human, it was a new environment for it. And it's still adapting to that new environment, which means that when it spreads from individual to individual, it picks up mutations in order to better adapt to the environment. And these then get spread on, um, get built upon in order to make it more adaptable to the system that it's now in and causing potentially more infectious diseases. So makes it spread easier from human to human or can cause more virulent um, strains. So causes a more severe disease outcome. All of this, we want to identify, we want to identify the mutations that can cause more infections or cause more virulent strains. So we went back to that 5 million data points um, data set and extracted the ones that had clear annotation for severe disease and mild disease. Now, to our shock, we only found 5,000 samples that are probably annotated all the rest of the five millions, they did not have that annotation. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail of why that's the case. So, but for the purpose of this, 5,000 was good enough, luckily, and we could go ahead and identify which mutations is associated with more severe outcome. And we probably have all heard about the spike protein, which is the one, uh, the protein that the vaccine is developed for, because it's it's a thing that brings it into the cell, but the viral genome has more elements around it that are around reproduction, that are around um, adhering to certain membranes or generally the function of it. And what we found is that elements outside the spike proteins influence whether it is more pathogenic, whether it's more infectious. And therefore our knowledge of that virus is actually still in its infancy and there's much more we need to learn about it. So this brings me to the next story around data interoperability. And I already said that we were shocked to not be able to use more of that 5 million data points. And the reason for that is that when a sample is submitted to the this largest database in the world, GIS8, there is one field 
that um, is called patient status. And in there, the, there sh there's meant to be an annotation around um, the outcome of the patient. But back in May 2020, most of this was not even filled in, so was not provided. We then partnered with GISAID to ask them to make that field mandatory, which helped a little bit in that it is a little bit more information available around hospitalization, asymptomatic, and so on. But the majority was still unknown because the information was actually not available. And therefore, we partnered with them um, in order to help the submission system um, capture this data in a better way. Uh, so in May 2021, so a year later, we have a lot of information now, but still it, unknown is still the predominant, uh, the predominant feature. So therefore we went in there and designed something that interacts or integrates directly with the healthcare system with a standard that is called FIRE, so the FAST uh, Health Interoperability uh, Standard. And here the idea is that you have um, the information coded, so rather than typing in free text, of you know, loss of sense of smell or anosmia or anything like that, which is sort of the same, the same bucket of information, you can code these terms. You can put an ontology on top of it and that makes it more machine readable. And if you do that, you might as well extract that information directly from the healthcare system. And that's basically what we've implemented and published. And hopefully going forward, that is more used in the future and can create the data can produce the data that we can actually use in order to better understand how the mutations in the virus is actually causing or is performing in the real world and what is the disease progression of those individuals. Similarly, this information hopefully will help us to see how the vaccine is performing and see if there are any escape mutants. So where the virus has accumulated a mutation that is actually um, evading the immune system that is trained to recognize the spike protein, this specific version of the spike protein. But if the virus is creating another version of the spike protein, escape mutant, and we need to know about that early on so we can update the vaccine and um, create a new version of it, just like in um, we have annual versions of the flu virus. So here, the, um, the onto server is something that CSR has created and could help with exactly that, with capturing this information in a systematic way. Um, it is currently, it's, it's used worldwide, so it underpins Australia's and UK's national health system. And um, it is, is something that I think will be absolutely central to the, a digital health system, to the disruption of the digital health um, system in the future. So with that, back to COVID and how we hopefully will be able to track those mutations that either cause more severe disease or cause the vaccine not to work anymore or any other changes in the virus when it's starting to emerge and will alert us to that early on. So here we are partnered with the um, ITIB from CSIR, the National uh, uh, Research Organization in India in order to capture their data set, combine it with Australia's data set in order to have this sort of the Asia Pacific region awareness um, capability that if a mutation is emerging in Australia or is emerging in India, we have that system that can alert us to it before it actually has gone to pandemic levels again. And this is actually, this capability is actually needed in the human health system as well. Um, and here we developed the serverless beacon. So beacon is a protocol that is very well used in the healthcare system already. It's used for rare genetic diseases where a clinician will have a patient that comes to them and that patient presents with a set of different mutations. Remember I was saying that there are 3 billion letters in the genome that could be changed. And on average, we do have 2 million differences between one person and the next, and 250 of those actually destroy a certain function in our body. And that is for healthy individuals. 
So there are 250 broken proteins, if you want, in your body, yet you function perfectly well. But that also means that if you if someone tries to diagnose you, they have to sift through those 250, rule them out in order to find the 250 first um, that might be causing the genetic disease. And for that, the beacon protocol is absolutely critical because the clinician can go in and can go to the cohorts around the world and can ask, have you seen this particular mutation? Because if you have, then chances are this one is actually not the one that drives this rare genetic disease because it's seen um, more frequently around the world. And by definition, a rare genetic disease cannot be, um, you know, cannot be common. So it is absolutely critical for rare genetic disease research to share their genomic data from around the world. And the Beacon Protocol allows for exactly doing that. And the reason it can do that is because it's using serverless. So again, allow me to walk you through how I think about serverless. So we're familiar with desktop computes where you can install whatever you want on it and it's relatively cheap to, um, to run it because it's your, it's your computer, all it needs is energy. And I would say this is akin to owning your own car. You can do whatever you want with it and it's relatively cost-effective. But the problem with that is you only have that one car and when you need a bigger car, well, too bad. Similarly, you do have to look after that car. You have to bring it to service and so on. If you don't want to do that and if you want to be more flexible, well, you might, you might hire a chauffeur. And that gives you the flexibility. Um, there's no overhead because the chauffeur might bring the car to the service and potentially the chauffeur can come back with a different car. But it's not very cost effective. Like in India, in India, it's a little bit different. But, uh, you know, the rest of the world, chauffeurs are very, very expensive. And this is akin to an auto scaling group in the cloud where you have all that flexibility of scaling up and down um, and someone else is looking after the system but it's very costly because that system is not just quickly going away when you don't need it anymore. And this is exactly where serverless comes in. So in serverless, you can scale up and down basically instantaneous, and there's no cost involved in um, increasing or shrinking the system, yet you have all the flexibility and um, all the no overhead um, of, your, of, of the system that you want. And the analogy will be a ride-sharing app where you can request the right car, the right size of the car, only at the time you need it, and it goes away without cost um, when you don't need it anymore. So with this capability, this is exactly what we needed in the human genomic space, where there might be one ginormous query that comes in um, that from a clinician, but there might be a lot of other times where the system is not queried at all, and therefore, catering to this one ginormous query um, all the time is very cost, uh, costly and we don't, we don't want that. But with serverless, we don't have that problem. So just to hammer that home in a traditional way, it would have cost more than 4,000 US dollar in order to maintain this system. And we brought that down to less than a cup of coffee per day, $15 uh, per month in order to serve that information to the rest of the world, which means that a lot of organizations around the world can now afford to share their vital genomic data with the rest of the world, which means the information about um, underrepresented or minorities in, in the world in order to really understand the full population structure of humans is absolutely vital to have every bit of information from all the corners of the world represented here. And with this cheap, um, affordable way, we can enable and democratize basically the access to that. So going one step further, all we're doing here is we want to offer this on a population scale um, quantity. So here we looked at the population of the US, which is 350 million samples, individuals, with their 3 billion letters in the genome, which means we're dealing with a one quintillion data point cohort or data set. And we want to process that in real time. And with serverless beacon, we can do that in a second. So this brings me to the last story around science accessibility. Now with 
with COVID in general, but cloud uh, is specifically, the talent around the world and the solutions around the world have become more accessible. It's basically a bridge between the developers and the people that have the need for a certain task. And specifically, so I would argue that it bridges the, uh, the gap between research and industry. And we've been um, using exactly that for the past five years where in 2016, we developed the first serverless application <clears throat> that demonstrated that it can handle something as complex as a research setup. And in 2019, we brought a digital product to the AWS marketplace, sort of the first health product on the AWS marketplace. And in 2020, I became um, a data hero, Australia's first data hero, and the only data hero that operates outside the IT space in the academic in the academic research setting. So therefore I sort of see myself as a as a conduit of bringing the research brilliance into the academic uh, into the industry setup. So coming back to the industry the, the health product that we put on the AWS marketplace. On one hand it's a straightforward a commercial narrative of having an academic product put on the AWS marketplace so that everyone in the world can use the same, uh, can use this product and can, um, a pro uh, can handle it or can execute it on their data. But it also, there's also a second narrative around data reproducibility in there, in that it is exactly the same setup that people can spin up at the press of a button through the infrastructure as code. So everything, the infrastructure that I showed you before, um, the, the architecture is basically encoded in one single file and people can press go on it and it automatically creates that architecture in their account, which means the architecture, the data handling, the workflow, everything is already there and all they need to do is point it to their data. And I think, for the purposes of Agile India, I think this is really interesting because not only is it reproducible, but it also makes it easier to build upon larger systems, basically to stand on the shoulders of giants and string those, um, those individual components together in order to build something that is larger than the sum of their parts. So to summarize, the so three things to remember from my talk is that disruption in the healthcare system really requires us to scale to these massive workloads. Like Frost and Sullivan was saying that by 2025, which is just around the corner, half the world's population will have been sequenced. And that is a massive amount of data that we're dealing with here. It's larger than Twitter, YouTube and astronomy combined, so the traditional big data disciplines combined. And for the healthcare system that is unprecedented it's scary, it's exciting, um, it's definitely something new. And therefore having technology experts like yourself help out in that system, I think is absolutely crucial. We've dipped our toes into that with Variance Bath, which is this um, genomic system that can handle a trillion uh, data points in genomic data sets to identify disease genes. And we've demonstrated that on the COVID, for example, the COVID data set, looking at which mutations in the COVID data set can cause more severe disease. The second part to that is that the disruption will come from data be shared globally. Because once you have sort of this gold mine of data, you can't harp on it. You do have to share it in order to really get the benefit from other data sets around the world as well. And here we develop the serverless beacon approach, which allows data to be shared in a more democratized um, approach where even smaller organizations around the world can contribute their genomic data of their rare population in order for um, the conditions around the world to get a better, better understanding of how the human genome actually functions. And of course, the onto server will be a large part uh, with a fast interoperable health system, the fire set up in order to um, have the data, the medical data in a more ontology, in a more machine readable setting to share directly from the healthcare system. 
But I think the biggest change in the in that system is that rather than bringing the data to the compute, it will be the other way around. The compute, the analytics needs to go to the data. And therefore, we need to come up with systems that are flexible, that are agile, that are um, federated in order to cater for a world like that, where the data is going to be all over the world distributed in their own little buckets, but we need to bring them together in order to make sense of it. So distributed machine learning around that as well. And the digital marketplace is one aspect that can cater for that because it allows you to create a system in your environment over here that can then be rolled out um, to the other elements or the other systems around the world in a reproducible way and in a way that allows people to build on top of it so we can create systems that are larger than the sum of their parts. So with that, I want to say thank you for listening. And if any of this sounds interesting, I encourage you to go to our webpage, bioinformatics.csro.au, because there are many more case studies and many more examples of how we could work together from a technology perspective, from a domain perspective, in order to make healthcare um, go one step further. With that, thank you very much. Wow, awesome. What a, what a great way to start the conference. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dennis. Uh, didn't expect anything less than that. Uh, and, and very nicely summarized the last three points, right? Like the, the key of your, uh, you know, the, the experience that you've had. And in the past, you've obviously shared uh, other case studies as well that you guys have been uh, working on. So, you know, it, it, it kind of builds on top of that. So, and also something very relevant as uh, we are going through COVID. But uh, I was just uh, mentioning in the chat that, uh, you know, there's so many organizations, at least I know that are still, which are technology organizations, but are still, uh, you know, afraid to move to cloud. And you guys have not only moved to AWS uh, five years ago, but also kind of, uh, pushing the envelope on uh, serverless and you know uh, a lot of open source contribution as well uh, from from your team so uh, it's pretty awesome uh, so i would again uh, encourage everyone in the audience who's interested in this space uh, you know to to help out right with this with this noble cause so you know this is ai for good kind of stuff so you know uh, bring it over and uh, would, would be great uh, to help uh, you know, advanced medical science and uh, humanity. Uh, so uh, I now quickly switch over to questions. I see we have five questions uh, for you, Dennis. So I'll quickly go through them. Uh, we'll, uh, we have sufficient time, so nothing to worry. Folks, if you have more questions, uh, please pour in. Uh, we, will, we will take uh, 10, 12 minutes more to, to go. So we will take a good number of questions. And of course, uh, Dr. Dennis will be available after this uh, in the Hangout section for you to uh, you know uh, have a face-to-face -face, uh, interaction with her. So with that, uh, let's uh, jump to the very first question we have, uh, which is uh, how is uh, data security uh, managed in serverless? Uh, particularly on data sharing and uh, storing, uh, story, uh, basically the restriction on storage of sensitive data. I'm sure you get this question a lot. <laughs> yeah, this is a fantastic question, for sure. So obviously one element around this is that the data at risk needs to be, uh, at rest needs to be protected and needs to be encrypted, which means that it only leaves the data in transit. And in serverless, the transit is quite frequent because you know, it goes through all of those systems and how can you protect it on all of those systems? So there's, um, there's definitely the catch in that in the past, when you had the Lambda functions in AWS, and it's the same in, 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 the other, um, in the other cloud providers as well, that you don't exclusively own a whole machine. You share it with other people. And the data that is copied in there, in the temp file and so on, it is theoretically accessible um, you know, with quirks and things like that by other users as well. Now, AWS and the other cloud providers have recognized that problem, especially for sensitive um, data. So therefore you can now specify that the Lambda function need to be exclusive, need to be exclusive on one, um, on one machine, which means you reserve the whole, the whole machine and the whole memory of it, and you can purge then afterwards 
uh, the, the actual information there. So I think from our perspective, we have come a step further, but you're absolutely right in terms of the data security that you have the, um, yeah, the, the full control. You don't have the full control, you know, sorry, you don't have the same level of control over where the data is, especially when your systems are failing, like when they're, when they're erring out and things like that, then what you would have with, say, a virtual machine. So I think this is still something that as a serverless community, we need to be mindful of, and we need to, um, we need to still be working on those elements around it. But I think, I think we've come a long way already in making it exclusive, in looking at what the error files are and so on. So I'm, I'm, I'm confident that we'll get there. Oh, I mean, we are probably 90% already there and it's just the edge cases that we need to now um, work on. Perfect. All right. Thanks, uh, Ashwat Narayan, for that uh, great question. Uh, I will move to the next one. So we have a question from Rajat. Uh, he's asking, uh, what database are you using for such large uh, data sets uh, for ML workloads? Yeah, excellent question for sure as well. So we started off with DynamoDB because once you go serverless, you never go back. <laughs> but we failed because as, um, DynamoDB and same thing with with the other uh, with the other set setups, they are designed for a certain amount of um, you know data input and output and handling in general. So I have to say most of the stuff that we're doing is still a flat file, because in the human genomic space, um, the indexing that we've done that was created or that was developed on that is already so good that a database uh, with a database scheme is not really adding any, any benefit to that. In saying that, we tried out Athena um, a while back, sort of as a, as a conduit between flat files and a database. And that wasn't, for us, that wasn't working either. So at this stage, it's really not a database. It is an indexed flat file that we're working with. Cool, so we can go delete all our databases. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Thanks, Rajat, for that question. Uh, next, we have uh, two back-to-back -back questions from Pradeep. Uh, I'll start with his uh, second question, which is, uh, how come a doctor became tech savvy? Uh, he's curious <laughs> <about> that. <laughs> well, I think it's out of necessity, right? Once you are dealt with the, uh, once you're facing this, uh, you know, this task of having to analyze that data, there, there, is, there is no other choice than to skill up Otherwise, you're completely failing and you're completely failing the patients that have donated their data for this greater good. So I think from our perspective that there is this necessity. But in saying that, I was really lucky in partnering with technology experts um, who really pointed me in the right direction and who helped us develop something that that is robust enough rather than you know put together with sticky tape, which probably would be what I would have done. <laughs> Cool, great, awesome. Uh, just moving on to the next question from Pradeep. Uh, he's asking any reason you chose AWS over other uh, providers? Mm. I think the short answer to that is we have not. Like we are working with um, Azure as well as Google and to some extent Alibaba in the quarantined Chinese market. So we are working with the three main cloud providers. Now, the way that I see them is that it's horses for courses. Like AWS is really, um, when you look at the, the magic quadrant of Gardner, AWS is, is the market leader in terms of developing new technology quickly. So if you want to have something that is really absolutely cutting edge and want to use the latest newest technology, you probably can't get past AWS um, in that thing. When you want to work with the healthcare system, though, there is a different emphasis on a robustness of the data the, that you want to have something, a throat to choke if you want. Um, so there's a, a, different, um, a different quality control around that. And Azure is really good for that. It makes everything slow and tedious, but in terms of the robustness that the healthcare system sometimes requires, they can definitely um, cater for that element. So therefore, if this is your priority, choose um, Azure. In terms of Google, 
I think they do have a lot of engagement with um, with systems here and there. They do have a lot of data sets um, available on their system. So th that is, if that is your, um, your priority area of being um, engaged with the rest, you know, with the rest of the system in terms of the data ecosystem, then uh, Google might be your priority. So I think from our perspective, again, it comes back to causes for causes and we're trying to be cloud agnostic so we typically have our cutting edge development on AWS, just because we want to see whether it's possible to do it. And once it matures a little bit, it probably moves across to Azure um, and then Google is sort of on the side as well. And I think from our perspective, it's, um, yeah, especially in the genomic space, Google is probably the one that is currently leading because the Broad Institute um has has been supported by google for so long verily and so on so yeah multi-cloud that's going to be the future okay cool uh i believe the next two questions are uh kind of next two questions are all i pretty much answered by this uh so there were similar questions around other platforms and stuff like that uh I see an interesting, uh, tricky question, I would say, uh, from Hemant. Uh, Hemant is a little skeptical that, uh, you know, he says, I get an impression uh, of uh, immensely relying on technology for data anonymization, while, uh, <clears throat> you know, these things may uh, fail sooner or later. So uh, while in uh, while in turn making uh, checks for additional mechanisms uh, while storing, so he, I think he's looking at uh, what what other kinds of uh, things you have in place if these things fail, and how you're dealing with uh, laws like GDPR and uh, HIPAA compliance and so forth. Yeah. So we are. Mm, that's a very good question. So we are working in the research space still, which means. Um, we have the permission from the patients to use the data, which is which rules out GDPR because it's all anonymized. In terms of the HIPAA compliance, um, it's again it, it it's not something that is um, where the where the, there's additional information stored. It's just the information that we need for our research product uh, project at this stage. In saying that, of course, moving forward, when we bring it into the healthcare system, all of this is relevant. And I would argue that GDPR and HIPAA is not going far enough because there's this whole um, can of worms in the genomic space where your genome, yes, it's your genome, but it also gives information about your family because they share half with your genome. Therefore, whatever you decide with your genome, um, th there's the, the risk that you're exposing people that are related to you as well. So the golden gate killer is, <laughs> is probably the best, uh, the best examples for that, where they actually caught that person because one of their, um, his relatives uh, uploaded their genome to Ancestry or had their genome processed by Ancestry or common. Uh, the police found them across uh, ac um, for, for, um, across that link. So I think in the future it will be um, it will be da people will become more savvy around what kind of data is where and how do you share the data. So therefore, I see this more as a dynamic patient consent problem, in that the patient gives consent to the data being used under certain circumstances and that can be updated at any moment at any um, point in time, which means that your systems need to work with data coming in and coming out and uh, you know being in flux all the time. And I think this is going to be a really difficult, complex space with say self-sovereign identity and things like that, that we need to take into um, account as well. So yeah. I definitely hear you that we're currently relying too much on um, the existing technology and there will need to be new technologies and new um, mindsets, I think, developed of that the data is owned by the patient rather than by a consortium. Perfect. And this is where we hope 
all of us can uh, do our bit to contribute uh, towards this because these are, I would say, uh, bleeding edge uh, tech concerns uh, that you know all of us should be trying to help out with. So uh, uh, great question again, Hemant, and uh, wonderfully handled, Dennis. Uh, I think we are pretty much uh, out of time. So again, thanks, uh, Dr. Dennis, and thanks everyone for joining in.